is Flow Talk by Henrik uh, Deliver. It's a great pleasure to have him. Uh, he's assistant professor at Tecol Polytechnique and has worked in the past in various labs around the world and Europe and worked with people such as uh, Francis Bach, Martin Yagi, Martin Wainwright in various positions. And uh, he works on uh, statistics, non parametric statistics, high dimensional learning, optimization, fairy learning, stochastic approximation, uh, stochastic gradient methods, and, and these kinds of topics. And uh, today he'll talk about exciting piece of research on compressing not just in one direction, but in two directions in distributed uh, training. So, Emmerich, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, first I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, both for inviting me, but also for this very nice seminar. Uh, I think it's it's really a great uh, source of resource, both during the talks and also the videos online that we often have a look at, even when we we cannot attend each of the meetings. And that's uh, really a great thing that has been now uh, going on for more than a year, I think. And, and that's uh, I think I would like to really thank the organizers for that. So uh, as, uh, as Peter just mentioned, I, I'm going to present a, 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 a work that we did with Constantin, Constantin Filipenko, who is uh, somewhere in the Zoom and is a PhD student now in, in his uh, second year of PhD uh, with me at Polytechnic. And this is a paper that we, we were very happy to see accepted yesterday at Maritimes. So uh, I'm going to briefly, I think, uh, present the, the context, and I think you all are experts on the context of federated learning and compression. So as we know, there are many different problems that we can try to tackle when talking about federated learning. And today, the two main problems that I will have in mind will be the heterogeneity problem, meaning the fact that if I consider n different agents that communicate with this central server in order to build a good model, then the distribution of each agent's data is not the same, so the first thing. So we have different distributions of data on each worker. And the second thing is that we consider communication constraints. That means that each agent does not freely communicate with the central server, or at least we are concerned by the cost of communication. So it could happen that some agents are just not available and partial participation of the agents could be seen as one kind of communication constraint. But more generally, we want to reduce the amounts of information that is communicated. And to do so, we're going to compress the information. We're going to use compression operators to just, I mean, basically reduce the size of the message which is sent from the local workers to the central server. And today, we're going to also focus on the other direction, meaning from the central server to all the workers. So uh, this is a very active line of research. Um, and there are, I think, several different directions that are addressed on, on, on compression operators and compression for federated learning. So I'll just try to um, list the three main directions that I, I think are the, main, the most important, even though they overlap a lot. The first one is proposing new compression operators. So, I mean, we started in 2015, 2016 with SINSGD and QSGD, which were very simple ways to compress a vector. And uh, now um, people have been working on building new compression operators like non-uniform QSGD or vector compression operators like Atomo, PowerSGD, or uh, hypersphere quantization. So this is one direction of research. Another direction is to understand how the properties of these compression operators relate to the convergence of the algorithms. So some of the compression operators that we consider can be biased or they can be unbiased. Uh, each operators can be independent from each other or not. Uh, they can have bounded variance uniformly or relatively to what they are compressing. So this is a very classical assumption that I'm going to use. The fact that the variance of an unbiased compressed operator would scale proportionally to the size, the squared norm of the vector I'm compressing. So this is really the interaction between classical algorithms and the assumptions that we have on the compression operators. And the third line of research, and again, these lines are meant to be overlapping, obviously they are not independent, is to understand how uh, in federated learning, uh, we have uh, an interaction between the compression operators and the setting. So for example, the bias in the compression operator has been shown to be something that prevents algorithms from converging 
And so there is a very interesting, a very nice, nice line of work on error feedback that shows that if we have, let's say, sine SGD, then sine SGD may end up just oscillating from some functions and never being able to reach the optimal point. But if we add some kind of correction, meaning that each time I make some error when I compress, I preserve some part of that error, then possibly I can recover conversions. And there is a last line of work, which is probably the one I'm the most interested in today, or the one I will use the most, which was introduced by in a paper by uh, Constantin Michenko, so not the same Constantin as the one working with me, the one working uh, at that time at least with uh, Peter. Uh, and there's this paper that proposed some kind of memory trick to tackle the impact of heterogeneity. So I'm going to present this trick in details, and some of what we do is going to be based directly on that intuition. So, uh, and one intuition is that even when we communicate at each step, basically compression can prevent the algorithms from converging if uh, we have heterogeneity between the words. So uh, the outline of today's talks is I'm going to present this paper, which is a paper by Constantina. I just wanted to mention, so this paper is really related to the third direction adapting the algorithms and modifying the algorithms and analyzing those algorithms when I use compression. And I wanted just to mention that in the abstract that was originally, originally on the website, we also, I also had planned to present another paper, which is mostly related to the first two points. But uh, in the interest of uh, giving enough details, I won't present this one today. So again, uh, this is a joint work with Constant. So what's the setting in bidirectional compression? I think it's uh, nearly straightforward to define. Uh, in most situations, and what most people have been looking at, uh, we compress the information sent from all devices to the central server. So that means that typically the gradients that we're going to compute on the local devices are going to be compressed before they are sent to the central server. And what we're going to have a look at today is what happens if we also compress what the central server has decided to do with the information and the information it's going to send to the local devices. So what we do in consequence is have two different compression operators. And we're not going to assume that these two compression operators are the same or that they have the same volumes. One is going to be used on the uplink direction and one on the downlink compression. So I'm always going to use uplink and down and downlink. Uplink meaning that it goes from the devices to the cloud, to the server, and downlink from the server and the cloud to the devices. So Obviously, and uh, we're going to talk about that again, there has been a lot of work on the uplink direction. And one first question is, why would it even be important to consider bidirectional compression? So um, let me just first say the assumption I'm going to make on the compression operators. I'm going to assume that both the comp these compression operators are unbiased, meaning that the expectation of the compression of any vector is going to be the vector itself. So these compression operators have to be random. And uh, also make an assumption on the squared uh, distance between the compressed and its expectations. So this is the variance of the compression operator. And I assume that there exist two different constants, omega up and omega down, that really quantify how much I'm compressing and how I mean, basically uh, strong the compression factor is. And as I mentioned before, we here assume that this compression, this variance is proportional to the scale of the vector that is compressed. So that applies to many different compression operators like quantization, sparsifications, and many other ones have been shown to satisfy this assumption. So as I, was, as I was just mentioning before, I think one important question is, do we need double compression? And why have people focused mostly on uh, single direction compression? So I think compression is well identified as a problem in federated learning. Uh, and if we have a look, for example, at the survey by Peter Carus and Coates, they mentioned that compression can be used in both directions, but the direction, the uplink direction, is probably the most efficient one to reduce the communication. And indeed, there are two different reasons to perform compression. The first one is to accelerate the learning process, and the second one is to limit the number of bits that are exchanged. And in terms of acceleration, there is some kind of asymmetry between uplink and downlink. Indeed, when we look at the uplink direction, we have n different workers sending a message to one server, this is n to one, while on the other hand, when I look at the downlink, it's one server sending a message to n different workers. And so depending on a framework, 
uh, there could be a big difference between this end-to-one -one and one-to-end communication. So there are some settings in which it's not too important to have a look at downlink communication. But on the other hand, uh, I want to argue that it's not always the case. On the other, there are many cases in which it's very important to compress in both directions, and it can also be useful. So uh, why do I mean that? First, in terms of speed. I mean, if we just think in this framework in which, let's say, my device downloads a model from the cloud every day. So this is my phone, and I just download a model every day on the internet. Then the uplink and downlink speeds in terms just of download and upload are not that different. There could be a factor from up to, let's say, one to four between uplink and downlink, upload and download speed, but not much more than that. And also, just in terms of communicated bits, I mean, if we think of a very simple example where I want to train, let's say, a text model that is uh, pretty heavy, let's say 100 megabytes. And so I want to send gradients every day from the server to the workers and vice versa. Then 100 megabytes is not something I would be happy to download every morning on my phone. There's just no way I would participate in such an experiment, just because it's going to be too slow and it's going to use too much battery on my phone. And in that situation, it's pretty clear that I want to compress both the message I upload and the message I download. Okay, so this is a bit of a mixed uh, message. What I just want you to, to, I mean, I hope you can agree on that, is that bidirectional compression can be useful in very interesting settings. So how do we perform bidirectional compression? Uh, basically, most of the uh, work that have been, has been done on the topic has considered this kind of iterations. So why do I mean here? We compute a stochastic gradient GKI. So I in N is just a worker. And K in N is an iteration number. And at, it, at iteration K on worker I, we compute a stochastic gradient. Then we compress this stochastic gradient uh, through this uplink compression operator. Then we aggregate all this information on the central server by averaging. And then what we want to do in order to be able to send back this information to the local workers, we're going to compress this aggregated information on the central server. OK, so this is how bidirectional was performed in at least uh, three to five uh, references on the topic. So these references are door, double squeeze, uh, this EFSGD by, by Zhang. Uh, one paper that we did on the topic previously, and a paper by Edward Dobunov and uh, Peter and Cortes on uh, linearly convergence uh, methods for distributed SD. But there is an appendix that directly deals with this doubly compressed principle. So in all these algorithms, this is really what is performed. Uh, we aggregate the information and compress it in order to use this compressed information both on the central server and on the local world. And that means that somehow we have received a lot of information. We have received this information on the central server, this one here. And we have decided to compress it before applying any updates. And we did so because we knew that we will have to send the information to the servers, to the workers afterwards. And that means that somehow we have artificially degraded what we did on the central server. Without downlink compression, we would have done that. But because we wanted to send something afterward to the servers, we degraded the updates. And what, what we're going to try to do in uh, today's presentation is to show that basically we do not need to degrade the central model, uh, and we can improve the convergence rates if we don't do so. So I, I will come back to the comparison to all these uh, algorithms that have double compression, and I will also compare a lot to the paper by Konstantin Michenko on Diana. So what do we expect when we do simple double compression? It's, uh, it's more or less straightforward, as I just shown on the previous slide. We're going to apply compression twice. So what we think is going to happen is that the level of noise, when I look at my iterates, I'm going to have a gradient, stochastic gradient, which is the down compression of the aggregated compressed gradients. And so basically, this is clearly unbiased if all my compression operators are unbiased. But the variance is going to increase proportionally 
to the compression factor on the uplink direction multiplied by the compression factor on the downlink compression. So what we're gonna get at the very end is something like a limit variance that increases proportionally to omega down time omega. And so if I look at convergence curves, so something like that, what we're gonna see is that SGD converges, let's say with a constant step size and in terms of number of iterations, SGD is gonna converge and saturate at some level. Then if I use unidirectional compression, I'm gonna increase the saturation level. And if I use bidirectional compression, I'm increasing again this saturation level. So it doesn't seem I'm gaining much. In fact, I'm gaining a bit if I really aim for low precision regimes. What we're gonna see in terms of number of communicated bits is that, okay, bidirectional compression can do a bit better than unidirectional compression at the very beginning, but then saturates higher, et cetera, et cetera. So in that setting and with this degraded framework, degraded central model framework, we gain a little bit in a framework, but we lose a lot. We still lose something with respect to unidirectional compression. And in fact, this, this effect that the variance increases, it can be shown to be just tight. Uh, we can show that the sequence of it rates converges in distribution and that the limit variance of this distribution is in fact really increased by this factor omega up times omega. So it's not even an artifact. So uh, the first uh, thing that I want to mention and present is how to reduce the impact of heterogeneity. Uh, this is not something which is at the heart of our paper, but something we are gonna use and, and leverage otherwise. So this is the idea that presented Constantine in this Diana paper. The intuition is that if I have heterogeneity, one way to quantify this heterogeneity is the value of the gradients at the optimal point. So here I'm looking at the, the gradients on worker number I, at the global optimal import. And I'm assuming that there is a unique optimal point. And for the sake of presentation, let's say I'm just in, in a strongly convex region. And so an assumption that we could just use is if all workers agree on the optimal point, that means that all the gradients at the optimal point are gonna be zero. And otherwise, if there is a lot of heterogeneity, typically the gradients of the function fi at point w star is not zero. And I'm gonna assume that there is an upper bound on this value. Then what happens in practice is that even if I'm converging, so let's assume that omega k goes to omega star, then let's assume that the gradient gk is the gradient of f, so it's a deterministic gradient. Then the compression of this gradient gk, the compression of the uplink direction of gki has a noise proportional to the square norm of the gradient of fi at wk, which basically is proportional to b squared or upper bounded by something of the order of b squared. So what, what it means is that what's happening is that our iterates try to converge to optimal points, but the noise introduced by the uplink compression completely destroys this convergence because I have this kind of additive noise, even with deterministic gradients and even if I'm trying to. So to, I mean, basically to compensate that and to reduce this effect that we compress a quantity that doesn't go to zero, what we're gonna do is introduce this memory. And the reason why I'm just insist insisting on this memory is that we are gonna reuse exactly the same kind of memory, but on the downlink side. And the goal of this memory on the uplink side is to approximate the gradient of the function at points W star. And if I do so, what I'm gonna do afterwards in the algorithm is instead of compressing the gradient directly, I'm first gonna subtract this memory term, then compress, and I'm gonna add back this memory term when I have arrived on the central server. So this is really, again, the crucial intuition of the, this paper by Konstantin Mishenko. And uh, it, really completely uh, solves, or at least largely solves the problem of heterogeneity because we can recover uh, a linear convergence rates when we have deterministic gradients or when we don't have noise at the optimum. And so in terms of just uh, high level takeaway, 
using uplink memory helps with heterogeneity and makes these two algorithms, which are Artemis. So this is memory plus double compression and Diana, which is memory plus single direction compression uh, to converge much better and to, to come closer to SGD. Okay, so next, uh, let's have a look at how we can solve this problem that I, I just mentioned before that we cannot improve the limit variance as long as we do this kind of degraded updates. So the part I'm concerned about here is this idea that I received a lot of information. So that's what I received on the central server. And in all articles that were considered before us, the information was compressed before applying the update. What we want to do is instead have two different equations. So we have this main iterate WK, which is gonna be only on the central server that uses all the information. So that's why we say that it's preserved or not degraded. We use all the information we have received. And afterwards, we send a different update on the local workbooks. And in order to ensure that the message is compressed, when I send the message to the local workers, I compress the information that I had received. And it means that I have WK and W hat K, which are different. And one extremely important uh, aspect of our approach is that we're always going to ensure that the expectation of the local iterate is uh, basically the central iterate, the iterate hold on the central server. So this unbiased property is going to be very important. So does anyone see what the problem is here in the sequence of iterates that I have defined? There is a big problem, in fact. In fact, to define the case iterates on the local workers, I have assumed that I know WK minus one. And WK minus one is the one which is holds on the central server. So this is, this is not a practical algorithm. We cannot compute that uh, unless we cheat on how we do things. Because to compute the local uh, model, I have used the central model at the previous iteration. And the way I'm going to present the results that we have are going to be in two parts. I'm first going to present the results assuming that I do this algorithm. So I'm going to call this algorithm a ghost algorithm because I mean we cannot do it in practice. And afterwards, I'm going to show how we can adapt this algorithm to have something which is practical. But focusing on this ghost algorithm is going to be uh, much easier. And go, it's, it allows me to give all elements of the proof. Okay, so. Uh, this is exactly what I just said, that this update is not feasible, and we refer to that as the ghost algorithm. Mm -hmm. So how do we analyze such an algorithm? And first, what do we hope for? What we hope for is that the convergence rate of these ghosts, or, and afterwards, our MCM algorithm, is going to be nearly the same as the one doing direction, unidirectional compression, so only uplink compression. And obviously, its complexity in terms of communicated bits is going to be the same as any other bidirectional compression operator. So this is what we hope for, and we're going to show that it's nearly what we obtain. So uh, the outline of the presentation from now on is going to be uh, uh, simple. I'm going to present the assumptions I make, or at least strong assumptions that we make for the presentation to be simple enough. Then I'm going to present this convergence of this ghost algorithm. I'm going to present the sketch of the proof. Uh, I'm going to present how we can adapt that into a practical algorithm and a few extensions that are of interest. So do you have questions up to that point, perhaps? Or shall I go on? OK, OK, let me I go said, on. I, I suggest we wait like 20 seconds, because I'm pretty sure somebody's going to want to ask something. I hope nobody will disappoint me and somebody will not, will prove me right. <laughs> I'm just waiting. Okay, otherwise I go on and whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. So, okay, let's have a look at 
these assumptions first. I'm going to assume very simple assumptions for the sake of the presentation. I'm going to assume smoothness of the function. Uh, so the fact that the function is uh, basically uh, has Lipschitz gradients. Then I'm going to assume that it's convex, but only in some theorems. In fact, we have theorems in non-convex, convex, and strongly convex regimes. And I'm going to assume that the noise, the variance of the gradient, is uniformly bounded. And this is clearly a strong assumption that we don't really want to make in practice, just because it's not valid for least squares, for example. And it can easily be relaxed uh, into just having, let's say, the noise bounded at the optimal point. But uh, for the sake of presentation, and uh, we are going to assume uh, this, uh, this assumption. So let me just recall uh, the algorithm we are having a look at. Uh, at I update my main iterates without downlink compression, and I send back an update which has some extra variance. And the variance that I have obviously is going to be proportional to the thing I have compressed. And this thing I'm compressing here uh, is uh, basically. Uh, gradients at point w hat k minus one that has been compressed. Okay. So the first thing we are going to have a look at is the variance of those local iterates. Because obviously, okay, so first some kind of intuition. What we are doing is we are doing stochastic gradient descent. So I have a local model here, but instead of computing the gradient at the correct points, so the point hold on the model, I'm having a random iterates w hat k, which is anywhere, let's say, around WK with no bias. So expectation of W hat K is WK. And I'm taking the gradient now at that point. So I'm taking gradient here. And I'm going to apply this gradient basically to the central iterate. OK? And I'm going to do that again and again. So I have my points, I have my next iterate that we had k plus one. And I take a gradient here and I apply it at the current iterate. Something like that. Okay. So this is in fact something that has been studied a lot in a different context. In the context of randomized smoothing. So this is a line of paper that was initiated by uh, John Ducci and Cortes people considered adding noise to the iterate at which I measure the gradient to improve the conditioning of the function. This is, if I take a non-smooth function, and instead of taking the gradients at the exact point I'm at, I instead add some Gaussian noise, then this is equivalent to considering a convolution of the function with a Gaussian kernel. And in fact, this makes the function smooth, and then I can recover convergence rates for smooth functions. So this intuition of having a look at perturbed iterates uh, that are centered around the central model are not new in the general context of learning. Here, the difference with smoothing is very important is that instead of adding a Gaussian noise that we control, in fact, it's a non-Gaussian noise because the compression noise is absolutely not Gaussian. And we have very little control about this noise. And on the other hand, obviously, we do not assume the function to be non-smooth. And we don't hope that this is going to smooth the function. We just I mean, we have a smooth function, and we're not going to improve its condition. OK, so uh, to control, basically, uh, the convergence, we're going to have a look at this variance here, so the square distance between omega k and omega hat k. And it's very simple to control that in this algorithm, because basically, the variance comes from this compression, this downlink compression. And what I'm compressing here is basically all the order of the gradients at points wk minus one plus a noise that comes from this one, a noise that comes from this one, and a noise that comes from this one. So I have three different noises, and the rest is just some kind of box. So let's have a look at the proof. Uh, we can write it down. If I just write exactly what the variance is, so the distance between the perturb iterates w hat k and the true iterates wk, then uh, obviously wk minus one cancels out. and I recover the compression of a vector delta minus the same delta. And by my assumption, A1 on my compression operator, this is upper bounding by omega down times the square norm of this delta vector. And afterwards, on this vector, I'm going to apply some kind of bias variance decomposition in order to control it with respect to the gradient of f at w hat k minus 1 plus 
some noise. Okay, so this is exactly what this result gives us. Gives us. We have a, basically we are proportional to the square norm of the gradient at the previous iterate plus a noise that combines several different noises. The second part of the proof is to apply this kind of random perturbate iterate. So what we do is very classical from the optimization point of view. We look at the square distance between WK and W star, and we expand this quantity. And we're going to expand this quantity into three terms. And the one I'm going to focus the most on is this one. OK? This is this inner product that we always want to lower bounds uh, without the minus sign, so upper bound with the minus sign, in order to show that uh, this is where the contraction or the gain comes from, so I want the gain to be large. And here, the way we are going to decompose this term, so this is really the same quantity here, is into two terms. So what I'm going to do is add and subtract the randomized iterates. We had k minus 1. And now I'm going to recognize different terms here. So the first one is going to be this quantity here, then this one. That's the same as this one. So, and the other one, I'm going to use the fact that this quantity here with the inner product of this one, this is just zero in expectation. So, why is that? Because this quantity is measurable with respect to two omega k minus one. And this quantity here has zero expectation with respect to omega k minus one. So, this is the other parts. This one gives me this one. And the other one is just zero. And now when I look at these two quantities, I have basically the first term, which is a strong contraction, and this one, which is a residual. So let's give a bit more details. Why do I say that this is a strong contraction? Because typically when we do non-perturbed iterate analysis, we get this quantity, but with omega k instead of omega hat k. And here we have something at the perturbed point. And I'm saying that it's at least as good as what I would get at the normal point. And why is that? Because even if this function is not always convex with respect to W hat, hat k minus one, what we use it to lower bound it is typically convex. So in smooth and strong convex settings, for example, I use this lower bound on the absolute value. And this is a convex function of W hat k minus one. And this is a convex function with respect W hat k minus one. So by Jensen, I can say that this quantity is upper bounded by mu WK minus one without the hat plus F of WK minus X. Okay, so really what I've done here is replace the perturbed e trade by the true e trade. I'm saying that what I was gaining here was at least as good as for the central model. So this is one inequality that I'm going to use. And another one that I'm going to use is to say that this quantity also allows me to gain something of the order of the stochastic gradient at the pair to iterate. OK, so this is a completely different part. And basically, in the proof, we're going to split the quantity on the first line between half time the first line and half times the second line. So I'm going to use both inequalities. One to recover the same thing as in the convergence of a non perturbed iterate, and the other half to control this residual term here. And so what can I say about this residual term here? It's a positive residual term. And if I have some assumption on the smoothness, I can just above bound it by the variance of my local iterates. So this is gamma. And this is exactly the quantity that I had controlled in the previous slide when I said that I could control the variance of the local iterates. So now I can put all things together. I'm going to look at this equation. This is just the same term. Uh, and let me just try to match each term. This quantity here, I decompose it as this one and this one. So the green one, now I cut it in two parts. The first part gives me that. The second part gives me that. So this is the first one and the second one. And the variance, so the orange part here, then I upper bound it by this time plus a bit of the variance that is here. And the rest of the quantity here gives me some part of the variance. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a bit an approximation of the proof. Uh, everything I've written is perfectly correct. I'm just moving the parts 
a bit around to show you that we have used this contraction to basically gain what we would have in a normal proof plus something which is a contraction that scales as the square norm of the grain. And the variance itself is proportional to the square norm of the grains, but at each rate k minus. So let's have a look at the theorem a, a bit more closely. Uh, what we have is that uh, we can first look at these two terms, this contraction that I gained and this variance that I lost. And basically, if I ensure that my step size is small enough, I can ensure that this quantity is always smaller than this one. So basically, when I enroll my equations, this one is going to cancel out, which is this one. And that just gives me an upper bound on the step size, which is not a huge constraint in practice. And we will discuss this maximal step size afterwards for the general algorithm. And exactly the same line of proofs applies for the strongly convex setting. Uh, it's kind of different for the non-convex setting, but we can still figure a way out to analyzing this perturbation. So this is the first thing. This is how I, I'm going to deal with this uh, extra variance. And the second thing is, how large is the limit variance of my iterates? So let's have a look at the limit variance. The limit variance is here. This is this quantity. This is always the same theorem as before. Uh, and I want to compare this quantity to the two cases that I mentioned before. So this is the one of Diana. And this is the one of Dor or Artemis. And what we see is that parts of the variance is exactly the same thing. So this sigma squared divided by n times the batch times gamma squared is shared on all algorithms. The uplink dependency is also exactly the same. And the only thing that changes is the impact of the downlink. And what we see is that obviously for Diana, there is no downlink compression. So obviously we recover exactly uh, this rate or this limit variance. For Doe and Artemis, as we mentioned before, we have a multiplicative factor. While for the Goth algorithm, in fact, the variance, there is a multiplicative factor W down, but it's multiplied by a gamma factor. And this gamma is exactly what we are very happy about because in many situations, gamma at the end of the day is going to be very small, let's say proportional to one of us. Meaning that there is no more dependence with respect to omega down in the dominating term of the convergence. And this is exactly the same intuition that's going to apply to MCN. In fact, what we are going to show, it's exactly the same convergence, same. But the only difference is going to be that we are going to have a square here on omega down, which is not going to change the message, in fact, because we are still going to have something that asymptotically, as gamma, as gamma goes to 0, recovers exactly the same rate as Diana algorithm. OK? So let's have a look at that. So uh, I think that's all uh, for Ghost. I'm going to summarize what I've just said. Up to that point, I have a very uh, simple algorithm, which is a hypothetical iterate that I cannot compute in practice, and that nearly recovers uh, the limit variance of simple compression uh, using this preserved central iterate frame. But I cannot implement it in practice. So how do I do that? Let's say I have uh, at least a few attempts. And basically, these were the things that we tried when we tried to build such an algorithm. The first thing we tried was to, instead of uh, having this I mean, support point here, w hat k minus 1, let's say, OK, I change this support point into the one I hold on the local surface. So now I use this point as a support point, and the compression is going to be uh, exactly the same as before. The thing is that it's not going to work. And I'm going to show that it doesn't work afterwards because I have no reason that for w hat k to remain close to wk. Basically, I'm always adding noise, and these noises are just going to add up and slowly diverge. The second thing I could do is to just compress the model. And this is clearly not a good thing to do because, as we mentioned before, wk is absolutely not going to 0. It's the model. It has no reason to go to 0. So even though that would satisfy the assumption that w hat k in expectation is wk, uh, what I would be compressing and the variance of the compression would absolutely not decrease. So this is all no, also not something I can do. And finally, something I could try to do uh, and would be perhaps the thing we, we hoped the more uh, would work at the beginning was to compress the difference between this model 
that are built on the central server and the previous model I would hold. Clearly, this also satisfies the unbiased assumption. And now the variance only depends on this distance. The problem is that here the noise is going to expand with iterations because I have a noise that's say proportional to sigma square in that iterate. Then I'm going to have a noise which is impacted by the sigma square when I compress that. Noise. So if I try that in practice, these three solutions, what happens is that all algorithms tend to diverge or at least not converge. So these are the three algorithms that I just mentioned with the same colors, and they correspond to these three algorithms here. And on two very simple data sets, the algorithm just doesn't converge or diverges extremely fast. And what we are going to do instead is to remark that these two extreme cases can be seen as using an update parameter on some memory, the same memory as the one that was used by Constantine, and to define something in between, which is going to be this MCM algorithm. So let's have a look at the formal definition of the algorithm. We have this downlink memory term, which is HK uh, for any K in N, which is going to be available both locally and on the central server. And instead of compressing the model itself, I'm going to compress the difference between the model and the central server. So this is exactly that step. And afterwards, I'm going to update, obviously, the local model by adding the compression of the difference to the memory. And I update the memory. So that's local model here. And finally, the update of the memory. So this is exactly the same thing as the memory in the uplink direction, but for a completely different purpose. Instead of being in order to basically uh, reduce the impact of heterogeneity, what we do is try to reduce the variance of the local interface. And uh, what we can do from that point is to try to control uh, this memory and this variance. So the variance of WK around, so the expectation of W hat K minus WK can be controlled as it's the compression of this quantity omega k minus hk minus one plus hk minus one. Basically, we recover that this is proportional to omega down times the square norm of wk minus hk minus one. And this is the quantity that we're going to name epsilon k and that we're going to try to control. And instead of having, as we had for ghost, that the variance is bounded proportionally to the square norm of the gradient plus some noise. Now we have an extra part in the process, which is the fact that the, the process is auto-recursive. So it has a contraction with respect to its previous value plus exactly the same thing as for this. So this means that basically the variance of epsilon k depends on all square norms of the gradient of f at omega i squared or j squared for any j smaller than k. So basically, I depend on the square norm of all gradients before, but thanks to the contraction, I'm going to be able to have a uniform control. And OK, if we have this control of the variance, then basically, we can have a control of the uh, iterates. And uh, it gives us exactly or ne nearly exactly the same result as before. Uh, I'm just going to have a look. OK, I can have a look at both equations. Uh, we use exactly the same perturbed iterate technique, and we show that there is some kind of Lyapunov function such that I have vk minus one minus vk. So this is something that is going to basically telescope if I unroll this equation, plus a variance. And what I really want to have a look at is this phi function that is uh, in, in the variance. We have in this variance exactly the same terms that I had before, so gamma square, sigma square, nb times one plus omega up. And as I have already spoiled before, here we have this one plus gamma omega down square, while for ghosts, we had exactly the same thing with one plus gamma omega down. So the only difference is the square. 
And so the takeaway is exactly the same. If I now basically unroll the equation and write the control that I have on the excess function, excess loss of the polyac Rupert average, so this is the polyac Rupert average that I always control in this kind of proofs, then what I get is that I have the main term that only depends on omega up, so no dependency on omega down, and the only dependence on omega down is in a term which is of lower order. So this one is of order one of the square root of k, and the other one of order one of k. And we can also extend that, obviously, if there is no noise, so in the deterministic setting or no noise at the optimum, then we can have a rate which is proportional to one of k. Okay, so uh, this is the important slide and the, the thing I have been saying several times. The limit bounds that we get is very close to the one of Diana and much better than the one of any of the other algorithm. So I think this is exactly the same slide as before, uh, saying that because we gain this term, we are much closer and we are nearly equivalent to the Diana framework and much better than this one. The only thing that I want to point out on this slide is that for those who are experts on the topic, I want to just check the results. We have tried to make this comparison as precise as possible by really citing precisely to which lemma and how to transfer from one theorem to the other one for each of the papers. So for example, I think one of the good variants is the one by Edward Gobunov and the theorem A1, in which we recover exactly this dependency, which is this bad dependency that scales quadratically with the rates. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, I think it's for the, uh, the, the simplest uh, convergence rates in the complex case. Next, I'm gonna just show that there is a similar convergence rates in a strongly complex case, and I don't really want to go into all the details. The main takeaways are that we recover linear convergence rates in the noiseless case, and uh, for the polyac report iterates, average iterates, with a weighted average, which is meant to make uh, everything nicer, we have the same phenomenon that the main part of the variance doesn't depend on the downlink compression. Um, the term that depends on the downlink compression, the term that depends on the downlink compression is multiplied by one over two. So much smaller and so completely uh, doesn't impact the asymptotic convergence. I have just another slide that is uh, I thought of interest. I think it's, it discusses what the maximal learning rate is. So in both situations I have just shown in strongly convex and convex, the optimal learning rates when I do many iterations decays with the number of iterations. This is very classical in all stochastic optimization. So in fact, the maximal value gamma max that I have doesn't directly impact the convergence of the algorithm. But still it's interesting to have a look at what the value is and we recover that we are bounded with respect to three quantities, one which corresponds to the only uplink compression, one corresponds to the only downlink compression, and is meant to avoid that this, this amplification of the noise that I mentioned before. And the third one, which is kind of a combination, and this one is not completely free. This one is a bit uh, something uh, which is not perfect, and that could be an interesting direction to try to remove this dependency on this product between omega down and the square roots of the sum of the two omegas. It's still better than what we get for any of the degraded frameworks. Oh, too bad, sorry for that. Switched back to the first slide. Just for that, oops, yes, here. It's still better than what we got for the degraded framework in which I have a product, but it's not perfect either. I'm trying to improve that as an open knowledge. So, okay, very quick summary of that. Uh, I think we are uh, close to uh, 45 minutes of talk. So I want to summarize for the first time the complexities that we get in each situations. What we show is that for our algorithm MCM, we have the same complexity when epsilon goes to zero as the one we get for uh, Diana. And it's much better than the one for Go. Oops. And uh, it can also it can be seen either in terms of complexity or in terms of uh, limits, uh, variance. Basically, we can go from one to the other. Okay, so now uh, 
just a few minutes to discuss some extensions and show you a few experiments that illustrate that. So what I've presented during the talk were the rates for the homogeneous framework, especially the proof for ghost. I didn't talk about heterogeneity uh, because it's, it's just simpler, but everything I've said applies to the heterogeneous framework with a, an extra factor of two. So it's exactly the same. And we also have, as I mentioned earlier, a theorem in the non-complex region. So the summary is that we have a model compression with memory, that's what MCM stands for, that allows us to recover nearly the same convergence rate as unidirectional compression, but with bidirectional compression. And it really relies on this unbiasedness property. And this is also an open direction that I'm gonna give at the end. We do not know how to extend that to biased compressions because basically we use this unbiasedness a lot. So, one extension which is a bit less uh, simple and a bit more interesting perhaps is the fact that our framework, we have different each rates at which we measure the gradient than the one we have on the central server that allows us also to use a different compression, a compression that depends on the worker. So I can use independent compression operators. I have one memory per worker in that situation. And that means that now I have one model on the central server and n different stochastic models, which are unbiased on each of the local workers. So this is useful in many situations. Post, uh, I mean, this independence can help in different convergence, we're gonna see it. And I mean, it's just a natural thing to do to say, we're gonna consider independent compressions. That's what we do on the uplink directions. Why not do it on the downlink compression? Then the workers could be allowed to choose the size, choose the compression level that they want. So it's just useful in practice. It can also help in case of partial participation. I can expand in that, on that if you want. And it could be used, and we don't uh, precisely quantify that, as a try as an attempt to limit, let's say, honest but curious clients. And say, okay, at the beginning, I'm sending to all my clients the models with a lot of noise, and I'm reducing the amount of noise or the compression level, that's the same thing, to the clients I trust the most. So this is just, I think, an, a framework that has many different kinds of applications, possibly it can also be used for some privacy applications, uh, but having one model, which is stochastic with the level of noise that I control on each of the worker, I think is a neat idea. And the main drawback is that we have to store n different memories instead of one. And one way to solve that is either to have, to use in practice here, the average memory. So this is something that can be done easily, or, to limit the number of groups that we make. We make G different groups with G smaller than N. And each group has one memory and there is one compression operator per group. Uh, what we have in terms of guarantee on that algorithm is that first, it's at least as good. So this is just a kind of safety check. We recover that the theorems that we proved before are still valid for my two randomized algorithms. And we can improve on one of the remaining terms, if we also assume the function to be quadratic. So here, the fact that the, the result is only for quadratic, I think can be removed. Uh, it's a bit more difficult. We need to make some assumptions that take self-concordance on the algorithm. Okay, so uh, this is just the takeaway. So we can reduce this term by a factor of N for round MCM and G uh, only make G groups and just one for MCM. So we have one term, which is better, and I don't want to go into all the Next, the experiments. Basically, the experiments just show what I've advertised. So if I look at this graph, I have here double compression, Artemis or Do. So Do has some kind of error feedback in it, but it doesn't help. And uh, here I have single compression and MCM and run MCM. So it's really um, having the same saturation level and same convergence as if I had single compression. And that is valid in most data sets we tried out. So I think here this is for quantum. Obviously, if I have a look in terms of number of communicated bits, then algorithms that communicate with compression in both directions are much better in terms of communication bits, this area. And only MCM and run MCM can really like have the same convergence as there. And I think I have many other plots on that. Uh, it's, it's the same for NIST, it's the same for Cypher on deep learning data sets. So happens for uh, superconduct. One interesting case here is this one, 
where we see that there is, a, there is some difference between the randomized one in brown and the non-randomized one in purple. So this is the impact of this randomization that reduces this exposure. And I think I have even more uh, results. Same takeaway here. Diana and MCM match in terms of loss, while DO is much worse for all these A9A fishing and WAI data sets. And again, same kind of message. If I look at NIST, fashion NIST, heterologist and NIST and CIFAR, basically I have one group, which is Diana and MCM, and another group, which is much worse. So we do not have exactly the same performance, and we do not claim we have exactly the same performance. We're just much closer to unidirectional compression. And this is with the constant step size. That is, we don't have the step size that decays to zero. And if the step size would decay to zero, then we'd have exactly the same rate. So let me just summarize. Uh, we have a new algorithms for bidirectional compression with a preserved central model. It nearly cancels out the impact of downing compression and has the same convergence rate as a Diana algorithm. Uh, we can, uh, there are several directions I have already mentioned. Quantifying the impact of smoothing, I think is very interesting uh, because we do not show any benefit from this randomized smoothing. Uh, we only show that it's at least as good. I think we could uh, gain something here. We could extend these proofs of random stem to the self-concordant framework. And uh, also perhaps uh, one direction that I really don't know how to tackle is this biased compression. At least uh, I don't know how to not lose too much when I do biased compression because this unbiasedness is something we use several times within the groups. And yes, thank you for your attention. And uh, just a couple of points of advertisement. If you know some people that are interested in postdocs or visits to France, uh, we can try to organize that. We would be very happy to welcome you uh, in Paris. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot, Emmerich, for this very nice talk.